Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to the BlockRef webinar organized by the British Blockchain Association. BlockRef stands for Blockchain Research and Education Forum. My name is Nassim Nakvi and I'm the president of the British Blockchain Association and the editor-in-chief of the JBB. I am your host for this webinar. Just a few announcements to make before I introduce you to our very special guest and start the session. First of all, the aims and objectives of these webinars to have a quality discussion and debates around current emerging trends in the blockchain space and also to raise awareness and most importantly, educate our members on key topics in the blockchain. Questions that we always wanted to ask but never really get a chance to do so. So these are bite-sized sessions, last for 20 to 25 minutes in a very easy to follow format. You can uh, listen into these sessions while driving or uh, at home. Um, there's no video, this is the audio podcast. And essentially seven questions and the guests will have two to three minutes uh, to answer uh, the question and share their expert views. <clears throat> So the list of all um, upcoming uh, webinars are on the website and we aim to host these once a month to begin with and members receive this join in link a week or so before uh, the session. So for the CPD certificates, please email our admin team with your full name that you would like to appear on the certificate and these will be sent out to you afterwards. So these webinars are exclusively, exclusively for BBA members and uh, we will upload these recordings on our YouTube channel afterwards under uh, Creative Commons. Uh, so at that point, they will be accessible by general public. Last month's webinar is uh, already available on YouTube. Uh, we also welcome organizations sponsoring these webinars and we'll be very happy to promote you in the beginning of the session by saying that, you know, the webinar is brought to you by XYZ. And very important to note that these videos will be permanently available on YouTube channel, so an excellent opportunity for ongoing exposure and publicity for your organization. So next month we have David Holding from Microsoft on 18th of July, speaking on blockchain and healthcare. Uh, so these are audio webinars. Some speakers might wish to share slides in future, uh, uh, in future, but there are no slides today. So let's get started. Um, today we have with us a very special guest, uh, Richard Brown, who is uh, on the advisory board of uh, the BBA, and he's uh, also the chief technology officer for R3. Um, I first came across Corda uh, sometime back in the beginning of last year when an article titled uh, Internet of Public Value was first published in the JBBA uh, by John Reynolds, uh, exploring various different use cases of Corda platform. And I would recommend that if you haven't read that article, uh, please do so if you want to learn more about Corda. So, so let's begin and let's enlighten ourselves and learn more directly from the expert, the man himself. Uh, Richard, welcome to the webinar. Thank you very much for having me, Nassim. I'm delighted to be here. So, um, Richard, the seven most commonly asked questions we have. So the first one is, uh, what exactly is Corda? And some people say, is, is it a blockchain? Is it a distributed ledger? Uh, we know it's a distributed ledger, but is it also a blockchain? I mean, are there blocks or uh, does it matter to define these? A great question, and, um, and, and yeah, go straight for, straight for the heart of the matter. So um, a, a great way to start. Um, so I'm going to say something that may sound confusing at first, but then then I'll, I'll explain. So so um, so when people ask me, I say yes, yes, you know, adamantly, Corda is a blockchain, and yet Corda has no blocks. So how can that be? Um, mm -hmm. and, and here's and here's the here's the um, here's, here's, here's how I explain it. When we started work on Corda as 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 R three back in two thousand and fifteen, um, the, the the irony of the situation was um, we didn't know we were starting work on Corda. We 
began as a as a as a, as a research and and, cons, and collaborative um, consulting episode, uh, consulting um, um, endeavor with um, with what was then a, a network of banks, and we were trying to answer the question: you know, what, if anything, is is the is is the meaning of, of, of blockchain technology, distributed ledger technology, to the financial industry, and, and, and what might its applicability be? Now, three years later, um, we've come much further than that. The 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 the, the result of that research, quarter, which I'll explain in a second. Um, 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 was, was, was the outcome and we've discovered it's far more broadly applicable it's not just for finance and, and we'll come on to all these things but we had this, um, this, this privilege to be able to think you know, what is the problem we're trying to solve what is it that these technologies can do and we concluded, and I think this is generally accepted now, that the opportunity for, for blockchain and, 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 um, and, and technologies like it in, in, in the business sector is, is enabling us to transform entire industries, entire markets. If we could somehow bring all the participants in the market into consensus about the things they care about about the deals, the trades, the insurance policies, the healthcare records, whatever it is, if we could build a platform that could bring the same level of optimization to a market that currently exists in individual firms, that the transformational potential would be huge. And, and of course, you know, the reason we were thinking these things was because we realized that some of the, some of the things that first were built for Bitcoin would allow you to do that. You know, if you had this idea that everybody in the network runs their own, their own copy of the software, their own node that they trust and acts on, acts on their behalf and verifies everything, then the mm. trust issue would be mitigated because they'd know for sure that what they saw was what their counterparts saw because a tr computer they trusted told them so. Uh, if we had transactions chained with the data they're modifying so you can follow the chain of logic, the chain of provenance all the way back to the beginning with digital signatures and identity layer and deterministic code execution and, um, and, and strict consensus with finality, it, all, the, all the things that, that, that flowed and will come onto um, would be enabled. So we took those as requirements. You know, how would I build a platform that would allow us to, to optimize entire industries by ensuring and by creating a situation where I know for sure that what I see is what you see, everybody's in consensus. The net, net of it is, is that what we discovered through this period, this process of, of research and development and requirements analysis is exactly what I just said. You needed a platform that allowed you to write deterministic code, that allowed you to have transactions that are digitally signed by those who are committing to them, transactions that commit or refer to any data on the ledger that already exists and which needs to be amended or mutated. Um, you need a consensus algorithm that ensures that if someone is proposing an update to the ledger everybody eventually concludes that that has been either confirmed or not confirmed so you work through all of those requirements and you end up with Corda which um, has all those um, requirements met the funny thing is and it looks just like a lot of pretty much all of the blockchains when you um, when you look closely the funny thing is and this is where I think we've created some controversy with um, some of our competitors when you follow that analysis one thing doesn't emerge from the analysis one of the things that doesn't emerge is the need to take all these individual transactions, these private transactions between groups of firms and batch them um, together and confirm them all at once. Um, and that's what a block is in a, in a regular blockchain. What is a block? A block is just a batch of transactions that's getting confirmed at once. What we discovered was you don't need to do that except for some high performance scenarios. And usually you don't want to do it because it then conflates and um, intermingles lots of different people's transactions, which can cause a privacy leak. So I say, yes, Cordura is a blockchain because it solves the problems the blockchain solve. It solves the problems the enterprise blockchain solve for business. Um, but it's a blockchain without any blocks because unlike blockchains that confirm transactions in batches we confirm every transaction as they come in real time as soon as they're ready to be confirmed um, and, and that's, 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 um, that's I think the essence of what makes Corda different. Yeah excellent I think this is very very clear explanations very very clear and the, the next question is kind of linked to this is about the, the taxonomy of the distributed ledger and one way of defining it is I suppose by looking at uh, kind of obviously this very oversimplified like read and write access so anyone can read it's it's public anyone can write it's permission less so therefore possible combination and so on so corda is it private is it public is it permissioned i mean how does it achieve kind of consensus are there validated participants who choose like who gets to make entries into the ledger or can you have just read only access for some, for some parties yeah, great, great question. So maybe the first first starting off point here is is to distinguish between Corda as software and Corda as a running network. So, so the first thing to point out um, is that you know, Corda is is open source software. You can go to GitHub.com slash Corda slash Corda, and there, there's there's the code. You can see all the contributors, all the developers. You can see it being developed in real time. 
time. Mm -hmm. And you can take a quarter and then you um, and then you can deploy it. Now, when you deploy it, the question, of course, is, and the observation is, there's no point deploying it just for yourself. You know, you, the whole point is, this is to enable, you know, participants in the network to communicate. Yeah. So, so multiple firms have to deploy this code at once. So then the question is, in what mode do they want to deploy it? Now, you can deploy Corda in, um, in a very liberal, in a very open mode. There's an open source project building on Corda called Cordite, which is um, quite, quite a fun name. And, and that's, that's, that, that's building a, an open um, Corda network. But what we find is what op often people want, and certainly all you know, the, the major use cases and, and projects we're working on, what people want is actually quite a subtle level of control because they want the following things. One is um, they, they, they want the only people who can see a transaction to be people who have a need to see it. And the example here is, and this is a foundational part of Corda's design. You know, if you and I enter into a transaction um, that maybe you know, maybe you've lent me some money, you know, that's a contract that only you and I should know about. You know, maybe we would include um, a third party bank or a lawyer if something goes wrong, but the people who should see that transaction are me, are me and you. And who should be allowed to update it? Well, if, if I'm including proof that I've paid some interest, the only party who should be able to update it is me to say money was owing. Here's the proof it's been paid. No, it, it is no longer owing. I want to force that transaction. You shouldn't have the right to reject it because I provided the proof. Similarly, if I haven't paid you by the by by a uh, by a deadline and I'm in default, you, know, you should be able to update that transaction and prove that I've missed the de missed the deadline and then take it to arbitration. So, so every single contract and every single state, as we call it, every object on the ledger has 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 has, has rules, which are the contracts that say here's who here's who can update them on what basis and here's the evidence they need to provide to to um to establish that it's a valid update. Sometimes all participants on a transaction need to sign it. Sometimes it's just one or two parties but it's at the contract level so that's who can that's who's allowed to update the ledger and it's based on the you know the need to know principle and the uh, and who needs to prove things to update it but there's then the second question and there's a third question after that there's the second question which is okay that's great that's who can update the ledger but who can who can see the changes because quite often the people who are updating it may be a subset of the number of interested parties so in yeah. Corda, we have the idea of observers. So you can say for this transaction or this contract type, you know, whatever the level of granularity is, you can say these are the these are the parties who can update it under what circumstances and in what order and so forth. But these are the parties who should be informed when something happens. And this is important because unlike other blockchains, Corda is not a gossip network. It's not a broadcast network. It is a point-to-point -point network where data is explicitly sent to those who have a need to know. So it's not like we permission people to observe and somehow they somehow they can look through the window the permissioning works the other way it's we explicitly decide to whom should these data objects be sent so, so that's that's for the observers and then the, the third question is you know it's all very well um me being able to propose an update and prove that i've, com I've complied with the rules but the third question is okay who confirms the transactions now, we don't want the transaction confirmers to have any say over the validity of the transaction. You know, that's for me and you or a participant of you know, insurance firms in the network or whatever it is. But we do need some group, some, like, some decentralized group. Um, these, this is obviously the role of miners in Bitcoin or orderers in Hyperledger Fabric. Some group that is independent of me or you who can confirm the transaction. And they have to be independent of me or you because there could be times when we're in a race. You know, I, I, I want to prove that I've paid before the day deadline you think the deadline has passed and that i'm in default and you know, we're in a race to prove who can get who you know who's who's right we want the transaction confirmation service to be independent we call that a notary pool you can have many of them on a corded network some of them can be sort of yeah, for, for certain scenarios, they can be run by a small number of groups and high performance. Others can be Byzantine fault tolerant, and you could even have you know, parties in there who potentially might collude or are, are, are bad guys, so to speak. So net net, Corda software can be used to build in any type of network. The most ob most common ones we see are ones where um, there are you know, transaction proposers. Transactions only go to those who need to see them. Transaction observers, who are a slightly larger group, who have transactions sent to them, and then the transaction confirmers, the notary pools as we call them, who actually mark a transaction as confirmed. Um, and on that piece, that is permissioned on most networks because what we discovered through the lengthy conversations with our members and, 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 and the people who helped us build Corda was they want to know that when a transaction is marked as confirmed, it will stay confirmed. 
And we, when we looked at things like um, Bitcoin and the public Ethereum network, some amazing, amazing um, innovation that's happened there. And it, it's inspired us all. It's, it's what gave us so many of our ideas. But one of the downsides of truly public permissionless networks one of the one of the compromises you have to make and it's a perfectly valid compromise for those networks but not for business the compromise you have to make is um in exchange for, for, for not knowing who the validators are you don't know how many there are and therefore you end up with probabilistic settlement which always has a risk that something you thought was confirmed becomes unconfirmed and that just couldn't work for our members so so we have our model um but hopefully that, that gives a good picture yeah that's that's, that's very clear very very clear explanation the question is then, then, in order to get started, I mean, uh, members ask this question all the time. I mean, if I want to use Scoda, so can I just just download it? Just go to GitHub, and start using it straight away. Do I have to do to purchase this some kind of software from from Corda company? Is it is it free to use? Are there maintenance costs to run this this software or what? Great question. Question. So, so Corda is free. Corda is open source software licensed through a very liberal license, Apache 2, which is the same license that the Hyperledger Foundation uses for its projects. Um, and I mean, we're very closely aligned to them from a, from a licensing perspective. Um, um, so you can download Corda. What I'd suggest you do is actually go to the Corda Docs site, which is docs.corda.net. And there's a getting started guide there. And, and what that does is it talks you through downloading the Java virtual machine, um, Java development kit because Corda runs on Java, which means it's accessible to the world's 12 million Java developers. It talks you through downloading a free development environment, and then it gives you the link to GitHub from within the development environment, which will download Corda, download the dependencies, and then you then point it at a sample. You can run the sample, and then you can really, excuse me, you can really explore and, and, and get your get your hands on how Corda works. But you're right to ask this question because you said, do you have to enter into a contract with the Corda company? No, you don't. But there is a commercial company involved in Corda, and that company is, is R3, the company um, and the CTO. So we are the, the primary maintainer, not the only um, contributor. There's lots of people contributing to Corda, but we're the primary contributor and we're the maintainer of Corda. And, and we do have a commercial version of Corda as well called Corda Enterprise. So the question you and your listeners may be asking yourselves is, well, well hang on, if Corda is free, what's this commercial version? What's all this about? Um, and, and I think it's really important that everybody understands this because then you know what our incentives are and you know what our business model is. Yeah. So, so at the core of, a core, of our, core of our, I guess, our vision and, and the insight underpinning Corda is, is the point I made earlier. You know, Corda is intended to be deployed by an entire market, an entire industry to optimize its operations. Um, mm. and, and, and it was just, it just seemed obvious to us that the only platforms that could succeed in that world are the open source ones. Can you imagine an industry deciding collectively it was going to use a blockchain that was proprietary and controlled by a single company? Just like how much power that company would have, what would happen if they went first, what would happen if they started putting the price up, that entire industry would be locked in, it would, it would be terrible for them. So, so the game theory there means it just seems obvious that it's the truly open platforms and more than that, the open um, general purpose platforms that will succeed. So it was very important to us that Corda was made open source very early in its life, which is what we did. And, and, that, and, that, and, that, and that, I guess that, that, that insight has, has proved to be true. Because as we look now, halfway through 2019, uh, what are the dominant enterprise blockchain platforms? It's the Hyperledger family, it's Enterprise Ethereum, and it's Corda. They are the three platforms you hear again and again, you know, the open platforms. The proprietary ones, the single vendor commercial ones, uh, you just don't see them very much these days because, because of those, those points I made. But... Mm. And this is really important. So we said Corda open source has to be capable. It has to be something you can deploy and it has to define the protocol. You know, Corda nodes, are, the protocol is defined by the open source version. But what we then do when you look at the network of Corda nodes, there are often larger firms or more sophisticated firms or firms with higher transaction throughputs who have some specific additional requirements. Maybe they need, need much higher throughput or they need, um, they, they need a special type of firewall to enable them to deploy on premises but connect to other, other nodes across the internet um, that, um, that no other platform has. They need integration with hardware security modules. There are specific features that 
individual firms in that business network may need. And what we offer them is we say, well, you know, you can contribute, you know, we're working really hard to make Corda brilliant. You can contribute these additions um, if you want, and we'll merge them into the open source code base. But we also have a team working on a commercial version that you as an individual firm in that network can choose to, to license. It's a very simple license. It's actually not that expensive when you look at it. And you, that individual firm, can deploy Corda Enterprise, the commercial distribution. The key point being that commercial distribution is completely compatible and interoperable with the free version. So what we see on many of our Corda networks is many of the participants are running the free version. Some of them are running the enterprise version because they have these additional needs and they can all coexist happily. And that creates, the, I guess it creates the right sort of balance of, of, of pressures and incentives because it means we continue to innovate, but it also gives um, safety and certainty to people in the network that you know, if we went bad, so to speak, they'd have, they'd, they'd, they'd have a path to safety. Um, so it, it's a really nice balance that keeps us all honest. And in the, in the enterprise uh, version, uh, Richard, uh, is there support available in terms of advice or engineers or is there like standard certification, et cetera? Uh, yeah, great question. So there is, there is all of that. So with the commercial version, you get access to R3 commercial support. So you can raise tickets with our support team if you encounter a bug or you have a question. And if it's a, you know, if it's, if it's a severity one incident, let's imagine you know, you're running quarter enterprise and you know, something bad happens in production, um, you can phone us 24 seven. And we have, we have support teams um, in three locations around the world. Uh, and we have an escalation process to, to get engineers from my development team in London out to bed if necessary. That's one of the things you get with the commercial distribution. But in addition, we have quarter training and we have quarter certification that's open to everybody. Um, that's available. I think hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people are now taking the training. I think yeah, thousands are taking the training. Hundreds are now certified quarter developers. Um, and we also have something called um, quarter professional services. So if you need um, you know, a consultant on site to give some advice or check over your app and make sure you've done it right, then you can um, then you can hire, hire a deep quarter expert but the higher to the same level as our as our quarter engineers um, who can come and help. But the important thing there is, you know, we're not we're not a services business. We're not a consultancy business. You know, the people who if we look at the big projects on Corda, it's um, a lot of firms are building the applications themselves. Some of them are using um, you know, big firms like Accenture. Some of them are using like small firms like one of our partners, Industria, in, in Bulgaria, as an example. There's the whole ecosystem that you can find out about at marketplace.r3.com. But we do have a very small number of very skilled engineers who you can call on to augment your team or to give you some advice. I mean, we want everybody to be successful. We want, you know, we want people, people to love using Corda and to get live and to, and to get business benefits from it. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Um, last two questions I would kind of sort of combine together. Um, what's the... I know you mentioned obviously a lot of very unique features and um, special uh, attributes of Corda. What are the what are the some of the unique features of special features of Corda that no other uh, distributed ledgers are currently offering? And the last question is if you have to offer this as a distributed ledger solution to governments, for example, then um, what are the three top three or four best use cases for for Corda for for, for public services? Okay, very good questions again. So, so, so some of the unique features um, I've so there are some there are some features that that were unique when we first released them, and other blockchains have since copied, and there are others that are still unique and, and more that are coming. So, so when we first launched Corda, um, one of its unique features was privacy. You know, this idea that data only goes to those who need it. Um, you know, it was controversial at the time. I think some people thought we were mad, or we were, you know, we were somehow, um, you know, sort of like betraying Satoshi's legacy or, or, or something <laughs> terrible. Um, and yet, I think everybody else now we talk like really focuses on, on, on privacy with their blockchains. But Corda remains the only blockchain that has this point to point architecture at its core. Um, most of the other ones, they start with global broadcast and then they, they, they sort of comp, they sort of um, partition the global broadcast into many sub blockchains. They may call them channels or something like that. And then they have sort of like you know, private data groups within that, but they start with a principle that everything goes everywhere. And then they try and sort of mitigate the, the issues that causes. We've always taken the opposite approach. You know, data doesn't move unless somebody moves it and they move it because some Somebody else has has, you know, has has a right to receive it. So that point-to-point -point messaging based architecture is, is, is unique. Um, second down point is and this sounds 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 like sounds not that exciting, but it's so critical to adoption. We've tried to make Corda 
look and feel like any other application that companies use. So Corda runs on the Java virtual machine. It stores its data in a regular relational database. It moves messages around using um, message queues like JMS, MQ, um, as you use the AMQP protocol under the covers. Um, so it's something that existing organizations, they can understand it. It doesn't look like alien technology when, when you're trying to get approval to, to, to deploy it in a bank. And that really makes it easy to much more easy to get these things live. Plus the fact, like I mentioned earlier, you know, a platform that the 12 million developers in Java are in the world can, can gain access to after a couple of days training is so powerful. You know, there's not that many developers who know Solidity and almost none of them can use Solidity securely. So it just, just in terms of skills, it, it, it's different. But two specific features that, um, that I think are, are, are really important. First one I, I hinted at earlier is something we call the, the Corda application firewall. And this is, this is utterly unique because if you think about how blockchains work and certainly um, other ones which are based on, you know, peer to so based on like, you know, broadcast communication, the general assumption is all nodes can connect to all the other nodes and they live on the public internet. And that's really hard for, for corporations to deal with. So what you see happen in a lot of um, enterprise blockchain deployments is the nodes are deployed. Um, it's really strange that they're actually deployed on a private, they're either deployed on a private network or they're all deployed on a single vendor's cloud, which kind of, you know, deploying everything on a private network sort of like eliminates a huge number of cost saving opportunities and deploying it all on a single vendor's cloud kind of makes you think, well, what decentralization is actually being achieved? So what we do in Corda instead is we said, actually, there's a way to fix this. We'll take the node, which you know, the node is doing communication with other nodes, but it's also communicating with internal systems and running its own logic. And we'll say, um, we'll say part of this needs to run deep in the data center or deep in, you know, deep, you know, deep, deep in your data center because it needs to communicate with your applications. So that needs to run you know, by the applications deep in the data center. But there's a much smaller part, um, there's a much smaller part that almost needs to be disconnected from the node, sort of pulled out and just allowed to sort of like float away and sort of like sit on the internet in the DMZ somewhere, that um, a really hardened piece connected back to the node with almost like with an umbilical cord, but floating away. We used to call it the float for this reason. And this is the thing that makes the connections to other nodes across the internet and receives inbound connections and validates them and makes sure they're from the right people. Um, and, and, and that, that idea was called the float. We now call it the blockchain firewall um, because to give people a better idea of what it is, that separation of the business logic of the node, which stays inside the data center and the network connectivity into effective, effectively two pieces. It, it, it resolves that dilemma. You get the security of running the node in the data center and you get the communication and communication and connectivity across the internet. So that's a key feature in the enterprise district. And I think for many firms, that's why they buy it because it, it's so valuable to them. And in the second example, which um, we didn't know we needed this until we worked with clients, and it's all about contract upgrades. Um, and it's the kind of thing you don't anticipate until you see see the product used in the wild. So we know how things like Bitcoin work. You know, if you need to upgrade the network, you need to do a hard or a soft fork. It's, it's quite a significant thing. Um, um, Ethereum has, 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 has shown some other ways of doing it. Perhaps if you've got you know, all participants in a contract agree, they can all sign to say, we'll change it from this version to that version. But that requires everybody to sign. And what happens if one of them says, I'm not going to sign, you've got a hold up problem and, 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 and it gets quite difficult. What we realized was that we need a, a much more flexible, almost social consensus or, you know, or social constraint model, whereby you can say things like, well, if this network of participants has deployed code from this vendor, maybe if that vendor publishes a new version and a majority of the participants countersign it, then when you encounter it at your option, you can start using the new version. So it doesn't require everybody to agree. Instead, you've pre-agreed what threshold of signatures would be, would be acceptable for the upgrade. And then you upgrade as you go piece by piece rather than requiring a big bang. So we call that signature constraints because the constraints on the contracts are defined by who signed them. And it's technical and it's, it's quite fiddly to think about, but it completely unlocks a lot of these complex network upgrade scenarios that are otherwise very complicated. So that's some of the key features that I think that make the quarter so attractive. In terms of if you're gonna offer this to, to governments, well, I think my advice to governments is very similar to my advice to, to all participants, which is, you know, blockchain is not the answer to all problems. The problem I think it, it solves uniquely, certainly enterprise blockchain and definitely Corda, is a situation where you have multiple parties who need to transact 
or communicate, whether it's, you know, say in the UK, the healthcare system is, is, is run by the government. You have, you, know, you have surgeries, you have um, hospitals, you have, you know, um, uh, diagnostic centers. You have a whole bunch of people who need to collaborate on your healthcare records. Um, in, you know, in banking, you've got the same thing. Anywhere where you've got multiple parties who are trying to maintain data, but they've got their own copies of it, they're out of sync, and, and, and you believe life would be so much better if they were in sync, um, that's a good place for, um, for a technology like Corda, especially if there's no single entity that can force everybody to move to a new system. Because if there's one party who's completely in control, they can just mandate a new system and it could be centralized. So my, my, my suspicion is the best opportunities in, in government are ones where, and this is going to sound weird because people don't think of government as decentralized, but where governance genuinely is decentralized. And in the UK, healthcare, local government, um, you know, sort of, um, sort of, yeah, um, and you look at things like, you know, um, anywhere where you've got um, um, uh, delegation to, to, to the regions and things where there's where you don't want a single dominant party they're all good um, good examples um, so I, I wrote a blog post about this last year where I said you know, I talked in terms of markets but but um, but the same applies in government I said you know markets are inherently decentralized it's about time the software that ran them was decentralized too and that's what Corda is and and I think the the it's, it's all, John Reynolds also mentioned in his, in his article about the interoperability which is so the, the education department is 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 uh, is, is uh, connected to the local council and local council is connected to the waste collection, but waste co collection doesn't need to be connected to education. So it's interoperability, which is a very exciting feature as well. That's a really good point. John, John Reynolds is, is um, I mean, he's 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 amazing because he's. I mean, I, I I don't want to speak for him in terms of the projects he's working on, but he's really led the way with the adoption of blockchain and Corda in, in the public sector. And, and you're right. I um, I've been remiss to uh, to omit the interoperability point because what I see with with some platforms is well take a step back you look at ethereum for example ethereum which has inspired so many of us you know, there's a single global ethereum network with lots of different applications and they can all interoperate what i see with a lot of enterprise blockchains is they're not aspiring to achieve the same thing each network is is privately and separately deployed um, so you don't get easy interop um, we, we, we think that's a missed opportunity. So we've spent a lot of time and effort building something we call Corda Network. Um, R3 has, has founded it, but R3 doesn't control it. It's controlled by an independent foundation. And the Corda Network is intended to be a layer of governance that put, put, puts um, sort of like shared standards for identity and consensus and, and, um, and, and how we work together. But it's intended to allow multiple different business networks to share common identity, common consensus. So there's different business networks, as you say, you know, maybe a um, maybe land registry type Title here talking to mortgage processors over there and these different applications can interoperate it's a, it's a really important part of the vision and then yeah, John's been John's been visionary in, in that area. Yes. So, excellent uh, what a fascinating webinar thank you Richard thank you very much for your time thank you everyone for joining in please email us to receive your CPD certificates thank you very much again uh, Richard for your time. You're welcome thanks so much for having me. Thank you take care bye bye.